mad as a hatter. Do you know the story behind the phrase? The insanity behind the character? The phrase was used to describe someone who's crazy or prone to unpredictable behavior. Between the 18th and 19th centuries, hatters used mercury in their creations. The mercury poisoning resulted in what was believed to be insanity and chaotic behavior. Thus, mad as a hatter was born. The following stories are my picks for further discussion. How the impact of mental health, relationship challenges and circumstances can lead to murder. It goes without saying that a mental health diagnosis does not create a murderer. However, in these cases, a diagnosis left untreated, the opportunity and the right catalyst can create a monster. Won't you come with me as we enter Wonderland after dark? Don't worry, it won't hurt. Call me God. For your review, the DC Sniper, John Allen Muhammad. John Allen Muhammad. Some of you might recognize that name as the DC Sniper. Others may recognize it as the Beltway Sniper. And even though he did have an accomplice by the name of Lee Boyd Malvo, this episode will focus on John, his history, his actions, and what might have led up to becoming one of the most deadliest shootings in the DMV area. John Allen Muhammad was born John Allen Williams, December 31, 1960, in New Orleans, Louisiana. John was raised by his aunt after his mother died at the age of four. John went to high school, graduated, got married to Carol Keegler. They had a son they named Lindbergh and joined the Louisiana Army National Guard. And at first, his military career seemed promising. He was described as being very personable, very outgoing by one of his commanders. However, by the early 1980s, things started to occur that might have been the first indicator of some trouble. There were two instances that he failed to report for duty and another of being violent with an officer. In 1985, he separated from his wife and then converted to Islam and joined the U.S. Army. He was stationed in Washington State, where he later married Mildred Green. Out of that marriage, the couple had three children. John seemed to be doing well in the Army. It seemed like a good fit, at least for the time being. While in the army, he became a skilled marksman. He served in Germany and did multiple tours in the Middle East during the Gulf War. In 1994, however, he left the military to start his own business. He first started out as an auto mechanic and then went to operating a karate school. Both ventures failed. In 1999, his second wife, Mildred, filed for divorce. That very next year, she got a restraining order against Muhammad because of the threats he was making against her. Pay close attention to that part, because we will revisit that around the end. Shortly after the order was issued, John would kidnap the three children from that marriage and go to the Caribbean. It was believed that this is also where John would meet his future accomplice, Lee Boyd Malvo. Muhammad later returned to the States, settling back in the state of Washington with his children. And as he tried to enroll them back in school, police officers found him and returned the children back to their mother's custody as within the divorce decree, she won full custody of the children. Enraged by the loss of his children after returning back to the States, he moved in with his mother. But I failed to mention, he did have his future accomplice with him, 
Lee Malvo returned when he came back to the States, enrolled in high school, and acted as John's son. Muhammad seemed to control every aspect of Malvo's life, imposing an exercise program and a special diet, one that reportedly consisted of just honey and crackers at one point. Malvo and James were taken into custody by immigration in December 2001 for being in the country illegally, but they were released while waiting for a hearing and Muhammad was soon reunited with Malvo. He began to teach Malvo how to use a gun at this point and they used a tree stump in a friend's backyard for target practice. All assuming preparing for what was to occur later in the fall of 2002. However, before the actual sniper shootings occurred, they were involved in a liquor store shooting in Alabama, an assault in Washington, D.C., and various other crimes. Muhammad's ex-wife Mildred and his three children live nearby in Maryland, and they are reported the actual targets of Muhammad as Muhammad stalked the family around the time the sniper attacks began. October 2002 was when the murders started. The first bullet striking down a 55-year-old man in a parking lot in Wheaton, Maryland. By 10 o'clock this next morning, four more people within a few miles of each other will have been murdered in similar fashion. The attacks are soon linked in a multi-major agency investigation is launched. The case was led by Montgomery County, Maryland Police Department. When within days, the FBI alone had some 400 agents who were monitoring the situation around the country and working the case. The shootings would continue to take 10 separate lives. But there were also woundings that many people don't talk about as well. A 13-year-old boy was wounded at school in Maryland, as well as another teenager who was shot and wounded. In front of a steakhouse, in front of a gas station, the shootings were random and had no distinct pattern to them. The DMV area was in a state of chaos and being terrorized by unknown entities. Early in the investigation, when crime profiles were coming out, the crime profile stated that the shooter was most likely a white male who did not have a lot of resources and contacts and was recluse with not a lot of success in relationships. So what surprise was it for everyone to find out that the snipers were in fact opposite of many of the things that were described in the crime profile. John was able to take a caprice and turn it into what the FBI called a rolling sniper's nest. And while John Allen Muhammad drove, it, Lee Boyd Malvo was perched in that sniper's nest and was shooting from the trunk of the vehicle. And while there weren't a lot of things left behind, the snipers did leave tarot cards, the death card specifically, at a lot of the shooting sites. And at the top of those tarot cards, in quotes, it says, call me God at the top. But one of the ma biggest breaks in the case ironically came from the snipers themselves. On October 17th, they received a call claiming to be one of the snipers and said that they were responsible for the murder of two women during the robbery of a liquor store in Montgomery, Alabama, just a month earlier. With that one phone call, a chain of events occurred and an agent from the office in Mobile gathered the evidence, quickly flew to Washington, D.C. with fingerprints to provide to the FBI laboratory. And that's where the next chain of events started to be the beginning of the end. 
for John and Lee in their murderous rampage. While the fingerprint database was being searched for the fingerprints of Lee Boyd Malvo from a previous arrest that was in Washington State, they were able to now have a suspect for the D.C. sniper shootings. An arrest record was provided that gave them information and also named a secondary accomplice, John Allen Muhammad. One of the agents from Tacoma recognized the name from a tip called into that office on another case. So now they had both individuals named and now knew who they were looking for. And as the record keeping continued in October tw- on October 22nd, they were also able to identify that Muhammad had registered to him a blue Chevy Caprice with the license plate number NDA21Z, New Jersey. So once they had a confirmation on the potential description of a vehicle, that information was released to the news media and shared far and wide, which allowed residents to have a location to have a description of who to look for as it relates to these shootings. And just two days later, after that information was released, on the 24th, the hunt for the snipers quickly came to an end. A team of the Maryland State Police, Montgomery County SWAT officers, and special agents from a hostage rescue unit arrested a sleeping John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Mavo without a struggle. Just a few hours earlier, at approximately 11.45, their dark blue 1990 Chevy Caprice with its New Jersey license plate had been spotted at a rest stop off of I-70 in Maryland. After the arrest, many items were found in the car. A Bushmaster .223 caliber rifle, a rifle scope for taking aim, a tripod was found, a back seat that had the sheet metal removed between the passenger and the compartment in the trunk that allowed the shooter to get into the trunk and shoot from inside the car, a digital voice recorder used by both Malvo and Muhammad to make extorted demands, a laptop stolen from one of the victims containing maps of the shooting sites and getaway routes for some of the crime scenes, and also a variety of maps, walkie-talkies, and other items that they were using on their shooting spree. The trial began, and in a move by John Allen Muhammad, by firing his court-appointed lawyers, he decided to defend himself during his own murder trial. They are just nothing but hackers. They just happen to work for the FBI or the CIA. This is a statement Muhammad said in closing of the investigators who examined the computer that showed the marked shooting scenes and getaway locations from the sites. He later goes on to say, let me tell you a story about the lying prosecutors and the lying policemen. Phew! And the story they told. In the state's closing argument, however, prosecutors said that Muhammad was a pathetic coward who played God over innocent people he shot as he hid from the trunk of a car. Showing the jury photos of six victims, also playing the message in the notes stating, call me God, that was left from shooting scenes and in phone calls to authorities. Muhammad sat with his chin in his hands for most of the closing arguments. There was never really a mental health statement that was brought to the trial in areas or times where that was allowed Muhammad chose not to allow this to happen again he was he was representing himself in his case in the end Muhammad would be found guilty and sentenced to the death penalty and although I did say that this was going to focus more on John Allen Muhammad I did want to bring out a statement that was said during the trial of Malvo, where during the trial, Malvo glared at the man he once considered a father figure and said, you took me into your house and you made me a monster. 
I couldn't say no. I had wanted that level of love and acceptance and consistency for all of my life and couldn't find it. And even if unconsciously or even in moments of short reflection, I knew that it was wrong, I did not have the willpower to say no. Now, there's many speculations and and many uh, theories about the relationship between Malvo and Muhammad and what actually occurred and what their nature of the relationship is. But at the end of that Malvo's trial, Muhammad did speak and say, I speak for my son. I don't care what you saw up there. I don't jump ship like that. I love my son. I know what they did to him. Muhammad said, my son is innocent and I'm asking you all to find us both innocent. Well, that didn't happen. They both were found guilty. As I mentioned earlier, Muhammad was sentenced to death while Mava was sentenced to a life prison sentence without the possibility of parole. However, a law that occurred that allowed somebody who was sentenced at the age Mava was sentenced that to be allowed to have an ability to get parole after 20 years. And that 20 years is this year. This year would be the 20 years where he did try to come up for parole and it was in fact denied. And Muhammad will die by lethal injection November 10th, 2009. But what was going on before all of this occurred. We had a little bit of insight as it related to how John Allen Muhammad was born, was raised, his, his early years. But not a lot is spoken about the reasoning behind his ex-wife and the needing of a restraining order. And I do want to highlight that this is the in the 20 year anniversary of these shootings, October is domestic violence awareness month. And I also want to highlight that there is statistical evidence that supports mass shooters do have connections a majority of the time with issues concerning domestic violence. And this situation is no different. Muhammad's ex-wife had to get a restraining order due to the violence that she sustained in that relationship. And the belief of him coming to that part of the country was specifically to look for her, to kill her. When she was able to get custody of the children, she fled to Maryland. It is no coincidence that the shootings began in Maryland. It's no coincidence that he was stalking her before the shootings began. And statistics show that over 75%, so over 75% of murder victims were stalked by their intimate partner in the past. 89% of female victims who were murdered who had been physically assaulted, had been stalked within 12 months of their murder. So all the statistics support the fact that what the ex-wife has been saying all along, that he came to kill me. He was coming to find me. You don't get a lifetime restraining order easily. But the challenge of lifetime restraining orders when there's still visitation allowed is a process. And, and the, the fact that she went to court to get full custody of her kids, she feels was the tipping point to push John Allen Muhammad to unleash the anger that he did and terrorize the region. So what we want to do is also focus on the fact that While we want to highlight the victims that were lost during this, we also want to bring attention to the fact that domestic violence impacts everybody. It's not a private matter. It's not something that just happens in closed-off areas. It's not a family issue. 
it's everybody's issue and it's something that has to be addressed. And if you don't want to take my word, let's look at some statistics. In a peer reviewed study that recently occurred when looking at domestic violence and linking to mass shootings, over two thirds of mass shootings were done with a perpetrator who had a background or some type of connection with domestic violence or a history of domestic violence. And the most deadliest shootings, the perpetrator had connections to being, being named somebody in a domestic violence situation. So what we're looking at is there is a need to clearly disarm domestic abusers. The links between domestic violence and gun violence show that women are 400% more likely to be killed by an abuser if there's a gun in the home, and that half of all intimate partner homicides are perpetrated using a gun. So we want to look at the fact that most of these mass shootings are domestic violence related, or they've had a history of domestic violence, and that there's guns associated with these occurrences. The information also stated that when you're looking at the fatality rate, over 83% were domestic violent related offenses, meaning the perpetrator in, this, in these mass shootings had a connection there. So even though we were not able to look at the mental health aspect because there really wasn't any mental health identified and there wasn't even enough information to talk about it, there had been some conversations from John Allen Muhammad's previous ex-wife, not the one that had the three kids that he was coming to Maryland to find, but the other one stated that when he returned from Saudi Arabia with the Gulf War, that he did, in her opinion, exhibit post-traumatic stress symptoms. Now, she is not a licensed clinician, and there is no uh, actual information supporting that again it was not brought up in court and Muhammad did not want to allow his mental health to come into the trial but that was from her opinion so bottom line is what we know with factual data he had a connection in in an experience and a background of being violent he has had ex-wife fled to get away from him to Maryland And it's no surprise that's where the shootings occurred. So be it that this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, be it that this is October, and that it is a passion of mine, I just wanted to end this episode with saying domestic violence is everyone's problem. If you know someone who's going through it, there's help. If you're going through it, there's help. Because what I will tell you this, and this is from my own experience, my professional experience, When somebody is wanting to get to whomever their victim is, whomever is in the way of that can also very quickly become a victim as well. And again, if you doubt anything I say, just search up some of the most deadliest mass shootings. And I guarantee you there's some type of family violence, some type of violence within that connection that you're going to be able to pull up. So... I want to end this episode just by giving out the information for the domestic violence hotline because it's very important that not only you know the information, but you're able to give it to others who might need to address it. And that number is 1-800-799-7233. Again, that the National Domestic Violence Hotline is one 800 799 seven two three three you can also text the word start s-t-a-r-t to number eight eight seven eight eight again you can text the word start to eight eight seven eight eight so let's look out for one another if you see something say something because what we don't ever want to happen is for you all to become another pick for the Mad Hatter.